So welcome everyone. Um, this is the Autonomous Technology Sensing and Control Workshop. Um, and for those of you who weren't at the um, at the intro at the barn on Wednesday, then what what this uh, or Tuesday, I guess, then what this uh, the the session was born based on um, some research that was initially funded by Cross on autonomous vehicle uh, hardware controller. Um, and since then, it's kind of expanded to a larger field of robotics and sensing um, with an emphasis on it being open source. And so with that said, um, over the summer, um, I had two open source research experience students who worked on uh, two elements of a similar problem, which is basically a localization mapping sensor that can be used by an autonomous vehicle. Um, and without giving too much away, uh, it's a it's a hybrid between a camera using machine learning um, and a movable lidar uh, that can provide uh, range and bearing to objects. Um, so there's those two talks, and then additionally we have a, a talk from one of Colleen Josephson's students, Stephen Taylor, who's going to talk about uh, microbial fuel cells and how they can be used to power. Uh, sensors, uh, remote sensors in the field and communicate over uh, long distances. And then last but not least, um, we have uh, a former OSRE student himself who's going to present on uh, his concept for autonomous navigation using um, basically machine learned uh, georeference landmarks in case of G in case of like a GPS denied environment. Um, the agenda looks something like this. Um, Bumil Dipani is going to be our first speaker, and he's going to talk about um, the, the LIDAR portion of the navigation sensor. Uh, then Carlos will talk about his uh, research proposal. And then Stephen Taylor will be talking about the microbial fuel cells. And finally, Pranay Matur will be talking about um, the machine learning aspect of the, uh, uh, of the hybrid sensor and in particularly how he can train his sensor to recognize any type of landmark um, for use for navigation. And then finally, uh, I'll wrap it up around 10 10.45. So with that said, um, Bamil, why don't you go ahead and start sharing your presentation and you can take it away. And by the way, you have about we're a little bit ahead of time, but you can have say 15 minutes to talk and then we'll open it up for, for questions and answers or Q and A. Yeah, sure, sure. Uh, let me share my screen. Is it up right? Yeah. Yeah, so today's my presentation topic is designing a sensor module for resource contained autonomous vehicle. Here, sensor module is uh, comprised of three sensors and actuators like LIDAR, magnetic encoder, and servo motor. And here, resource constraints means it is uh, it has limited onboard RAM, ROM, and uh, processing power or frequency, you can say. Uh, after, uh, so here, we are using B3HP LIDAR, AS5470 magnetic encoder, encoder and MG90S servo motor. First, let's go through the problem statements we have. So we need to develop the source code or software uh, which can control the sensors and actuators in resource constrained system. And uh, second one is we, need, we have to develop very low level hardware interactive uh, code for LIDAR, encoder and servo motor. We, we should also have to develop some uh, driving modes like range at angle, constant panning modes, and ideal mode to work. And at the last, we, uh, we are gathering the data from surroundings like uh, uh, the distance and the angle. And we need, to, uh, we need to send this data for further processing to our single, single board computer like Raspberry Pi, you can say. Uh, through Mavlink lightweight uh, protocol. So these are the four uh, problem statements we are going to cover. Uh, let's first take the overview of the module, the working of the module, you can say. In the uh, leftmost image, you can see we have one rover. And uh, in the rover, this is our orange part. It is demonstrating the sensor module on the rover jersey. 
and uh, we have different ob obstacles or object in the surroundings and uh, so here in the middle image we have our sensor module like this is our uh, encoder this is our leader small lightweight leader and this is our servo motor and the output of this sensor module could be one 2d map of the surrounding from minus 180 degree uh, sorry minus 190 degree to 90 degree so you can see like this and this uh, map can be further used to detect uh, to detect the objects or obstacles and navigate through the obstacles in the real time so our hardware subsystem is comprised of four uh, different components like lidar uh, raspberry pi pico servo motor and angular encoder lidar is scans for light detection and ranging and it is used to measure the accurate distance between the two uh, object and the uh, lidar uh, so our specification of our vcsp lidar is it can measure minimum distance of 5 cm and up to 40 meters and it is very high uh, measurement speed like it is 1 kilohertz so within a second you can measure 100 points uh, in your surroundings and the most uh, useful functionality of this leader is its user configurability uh, which is allows adjusting accuracy operating range and uh, measurement time so if taking an example if we know the surroundings of the leader would be won't be much too far then we can reduce the operating range which can further be used to increase the accuracy and decrease in the measurement time the second our uh, uh, component is Raspberry Pi Pico, which is a microcontroller and can be used to control the peripherals like uh, peripheral sensors and actuators. These are some specifications of the Raspberry Pi Pico. And we are using servo motor to accurately rotate the leader at a specific angle. And we also uh, have, uh, we also choose servo motor according to our need and the torque requirement. And last but not the least, we have this angular encoder, actually it is magnetic angular encoder, and which is very, which is very far precision than the traditional uh, rotating encoders. Uh, it is also comprised of uh, DAEC uh, technology, which is dynamic error, angle error compensation. Uh, the technology is like if our motor is rotating, taking very fast, and our encoder will take around 5 to 10 microseconds to uh, measure the uh, angle. So, uh, we can get 10 microseconds, our motor will be from, uh, our motor will rotate through some uh, milli degree or degree. So, uh, this DAEC technology can extrapolate that angle and give the accurate uh, real time angle at the uh, any given time. This is a simple uh, block diagram and inter uh, connection in, uh, between the hardware and the microcontrollers. So uh, to uh, connect LIDAR with the microcontroller, we are using I2C protocol and this SDA and SCL line. Uh, we are controlling this servo motor with PWN technology. We will go, uh, go into details in the further slides. And uh, to con uh, connect our encoder with the microcontroller we are using SPI protocol in this four MOSI MISO chip select and clock line and these are the power uh, diagram you can say these are the working modes I already uh, talked about uh, of our sensor module so we have range angle constant panning mode and ideal mode so range angle mode can be used to uh, uh, to measure the distance at a specific angle like in the example you can see we want to we want uh, angle at uh, 30 degree so it is actually minus 30 degree so uh, at right side we have minus 30 and plus side we have 30 so it's it should be minus 30 degree and uh, upon getting uh, giving this command our motor that servo motor will be rotated to the specific angle and uh, we have uh, configured, configured our this um, angle uh, mode, uh, mode so that it can uh, measure up to plus and minus 5 degree so if we give 30 as input it will measure from minus uh, from minus 25 to 
plus uh, minus 35 degree uh, dis um, uh, angle and with a uh, plus one degree increment. In the constant panning mode, we are using, uh, uh, we are rotating our motor uh, through, through and forth. Like if our uh, motor is at minus 90 degree, it will rotate up to plus 90 degree and go uh, from minus 90 degree to uh, plus 90 degree. So, and uh, with every five degree uh, uh, increment, it will, uh, LIDAR will take a measurement. This uh, five degree uh, angle is also configured uh, by user only. So according to the need and the surroundings of the uh, LIDAR, we can change the, the five degree uh, parameter. And this ideal mode is can be used to uh, save the battery power. So if we know uh, uh, in front of the leader, we don't have many obstacle in the uh, side of the leader, then this uh, ideal mode uh, it can, is very much useful. So in ideal mode, the, um, the, our servo motor will be remained on the zero degree angle and leader will take uh, angle uh, distance at zero degree with particular frequency like uh, 20, um, 20 hertz. So uh, it, it will take Every after every twenty millisecond, it will take the distance, uh, which is, is very uh, useful to save the battery power. And these are the uh, state diagram for how our uh, modes are changing from one to another. So uh, as we see, so we have three modes to work in. Uh, so whenever we boot reboot our uh, machine, it will be uh, it will go to this ideal mode. And uh, if we give uh, a input through serial port, it will uh, come to range at angle mode and it, uh, the motor will rotate it at the particular angle and it will take the measurement. After completing this uh, range at angle mode um, work, it will automatically come back to the ideal mode. If, if we are in ideal mode and we put S as an input to serial port, then we will come to this constant panning mode. As we know, the constant bearing mode motor will go uh, from minus 90 degree to 90 degree and take the measurements of its increment of five degree or user configurable parameter. And after completing, uh, so if we if we want to come uh, out of this constant panning mode, we can put X in serial port. And if we are in constant panning mode and we want to uh, go to range at angle mode, we can put A in the serial port and uh, we will directly uh, go from constant panning mode to range at angle mode. And after completing the task in range and angle mode, we will directly automatically come to constant panning mode. Uh, this is a demo video uh, we shot uh, to, uh, for working of this leader in our servo motor. So as you can see, uh, this is a zero degree angle. Uh, we are using servo motor to rotate our leader. Uh, this is plus 90 degrees. So, and you can also see the measurement on the console. Uh, every 90 degree we are taking the measurements. So see, at zero degree we are getting some 220 centimeters. So leader takes measurement in centimeter. Uh, this is our uh, servo motor, and we, we are taking measurement to minus 90 degree. Uh, here it is zero degree. Here it is plus 90 degree. And we are getting real time data on our console, which can further be used to detect uh, objects and uh, obstacles. Uh, this is minus 90 degree, you can see minus 90 degree in the distance in centimeters. Uh, so we are using these communication protocols like I2C, pulse width modulation, and SPI. As we already discussed, uh, we are using this SDA and SCL line. So we, uh, we are just using two lines to communicate uh, between the master and slave, like microcontroller and the sensor or actuator. And here we are using fast mode uh, I2C protocol. Uh, and uh, this PWM protocol can be used to trigger the uh, any actuator. Like uh, it, it can go from zero percentage to hundred percentage. 0% is like uh, LED is turned completely off and 100% is like uh, we are getting full brightness from the LED. Uh, so in our uh, uh, servo motor case, if we have managed 2.5 degree 
duty cycle, then it will rotate at minus 90 degree angle. And if we, we give 12.5 percent uh, duty cycle, then it will rotate at plus 90 degree. So in between this, we can give uh, the increment in the duty cycle uh, in li linear mode. And in the SPI protocol, uh, protocol, we are using four lines like MOSI, MISO, uh, signal clock, and chip select. MOSI here is like master out and slave in. And MISO means master in and slave out. Here we are using uh, like too much four wires, but it is actually a full duplex synchronous communication protocol. So we can have very fast um, uh, uh, data communication rate. And the last, uh, we are using this mail link to transfer the readings like from encoder and uh, leader to our single board computer, which can be further used to detect the you know, obstacles. Uh, the mail link, mail link is stands for micro air vehicle message marshalling library. And it can be used to communicate between drones, rovers, and the uh, ground station, ground control station. It is very light weight binary and header only messaging uh, uh, file. And it is very lightweight get, uh, we can use it in our uh, uh, resource constraint uh, and bandwidth constraint links. Actually, we are using our this uh, header file like mail link message obstacle distance dot edge. And the parameters we, uh, we are uh, focusing on are distances, increment and angle offset. This distances is an array of 72 members and so we will uh, we will read each distance at particular angles and we will store get all distance in one array and at the last when array is full we pass all the 72 readings at in a one single message uh, unique message and this increment is how much uh, there is how much gap we are putting in between all the readings like five degree or one degree you can say and angle offset is like from where we are starting the reading of the uh, leader or distance. Uh, so this is our uh, small robot JZ and this is our uh, sensor module. We have put our, uh, so this is a 3D printed module and we have put our encoder, uh, leader and uh, our servo motor here in front of the rover JZ. And uh, in the uh, future, we can use this rover JZ or any sensor module to test the real time, uh, real time data, and we can also gather the data surrounding the rover. Uh, so, conclusion of this project, like I, uh, I uh, this this open source autonomous vehicle controller is a great open source project to work on. I get to know many uh, good. Uh, concepts and techniques and implemented it uh, in a practical way. I even worked with very low level hardware to develop sensors and drivers. And I would also love to um, continue the my work in the future in this project. And these are some slides uh, which I put uh, like for detailed one why we uh, chose LIDAR, servo motor, encoder and controller. This is my presentation. Thank you. If you have any questions, you can ask. Great. Thanks, Bamil. Um, appreciate all the work you did for us over the summer, and, and that was a nice detailed presentation. Um, does anyone have any questions for Bamil about the, about the sensor itself? So um, I have a, it's not really a question, Bamil is more of a, um, allowing you to point out something, but um, you talk about using the Maplink protocol. Maybe you can explain how uh, in the block diagram where that would actually be, uh, where that data would be coming from, whether it's a uh, serial port or, or what have you, because that's one thing that wasn't in the block diagram is where the Maplink message goes. Yeah, so we are using UART communication protocol uh, for tra transforming from our Raspberry Pi to so uh, Raspberry Pi Pico to one of the single board computer. So we can use this. Uh, so we can use this uh, general uh, GPIO pin seven and eight. So you UART pin. Uh, we have two uh, for UART. We need two pins: uh, transmitter and receiver. And, 
and uh, this transmitter of the Raspberry Pi Pico can be con uh, connected to receiver of the single board computer like Raspberry Pi and uh, uh, transmitter of Pi to uh, receiver of uh, receiver of uh, Pi Pico and uh, we, we can use this uh, UART link to communicate this uh, distance and uh, angle measurements. We can use this GPIO 7 and 8 pins for this UART communication. Great. So um, basically to, to reiterate then, the, the Mavlink protocol is used out of a serial port um, and it goes to uh, a single board computer that's doing basically, that's controlling the operations of the drone or the autonomous system. And this is one of the modules that might connect up to the, the single board computer. Great. Um, does anyone have a question for Bamil? Feel free to just unmute yourself and ask, or you can raise your hand and I can call on you. Okay. I don't I don't see any questions. So thanks, Bamil. You can stop sharing. Thank you. And I will go to so Carlos uh, Espinosa is going to talk next on uh, UAV localization using CNN enabled landmark detection of geo-referenced imagery. Um, Carlos, you can go ahead and share your screen if you like and begin. Okay, thank you. Can you see my presentation? Yeah, we can see it. Okay. Well, good morning. Uh, thank you for uh, attending this, uh, this presentation. So um, what I'm going to present today is an outline of my research um, without getting into uh, many technical details, meaning that I won't be showing you any equations or uh, um, snippets, snippets of algorithms today, uh, but more like a outline of the main components and um, getting for this uh, project. Now, um, so one of the main, uh, one of the very challenging parts of creating a fully autonomous uh, uh, UAB or platform or robot is to have a self-contained navigation system, meaning that it can be it can be carried by the platform. And um, in the traditional systems, uh, like trying to get an autonomous uh, or to to develop an autonomous vehicle, one of the uh, most used sensors for location is um, using some uh, flavor of uh, global navigation satellite system. Uh, this can be the GPS uh, that is particular for the US, but there are other systems um, like the GLONASS uh, that is Russian or Baidu that is uh, Chinese, but the idea is the same of using uh, satellites to to uh, to locate the, the platform. Uh, there are uh, some um, reasons of why uh, no, don't or, or, or try to depend less on this uh, particular sensor. I will get into the details of that. Um, but also uh, alter one of the alternatives for these uh, type of um, of to, to support or to replace this type of location system are uh, vision-based navigation. Uh, that is a very active area of research and is um, my uh, main uh, research interest uh, for what I'm going to, uh, for what I'm working on. Uh, 
now, uh, why uh, we don't, or you generally don't want to depend so much on GPS, especially for, um, for UAVs, is that uh, it, is, it, is, it is vulnerable to degradation. The signal of the GPS is vulnerable to degradation in many um, situations in which you would like to have a very reliable um, location system. For example, when you are um, navigating close to building stru structures or you are um, close to water bodies or, or um, navigating indoor environments. So these are some of the examples of, uh, of situations in which the GPS signal um, uh, may fail. Or, or be uh, degraded. But another reason is also because it is vulnerable to malicious attacks. So one of the, the things that um, can happen or, or how GPS can be hacked is something called uh, GPS spoofing that is uh, basically sending a fake uh, signal to the, to the vehicle to, um, to make, to make it think that it's a, a different location that it actually is. And uh, on traditional systems, as you may rely solely on GPS, this, is, um, this can be a, a, a big problem. Um, now, uh, what is out there regarding of navigation in GPS denied environments? So I, I here I try to summarize what um, some of the most uh, important research efforts towards these uh, in, in this area. Uh, but um, even though I have, them, I have them here in a form of a list, uh, one thing that I would like to mention is that often these methods are combined, uh, supporting each other. Uh, so for example, one of them that I can be, that can be uh, used by its own is um, visual inertial odometry. In here, in, in, that, in this method, uh, the visual uh, part supports the, um, uh, like the, the, they are, they work together to have a better estimation of, of, the, loca of, the, of the location and the pose of the vehicle. But these visual inertial odometries often uh, combine, for example, with simultaneous location and mapping, that is SLAM. And um, also we can have different uh, combinations of visual data and another type of, 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 of sensor or inertial, another type of sensor, for example, it can be LIDAR or a radar, uh, but, um, especially for, for UAVs, one of the most used is, is visual inertial odometry combined with, um, with other methods. Um, now, um, simultaneous localization and mapping is another one that is very, um, very, uh, I, I don't want to call it popular, but it's, it's, it's used a lot. But one of the problems with um, simultaneous localization and mapping is that um, it is great for, um, for, for environments that are completely unknown. But the thing is that for in many situations, you actually have some information about the place or the location of the mission. And that is when um, geo-reference localization can, can be used. When you have previous information about uh, the, the place of the mission, meaning that you have a map, uh, you can use that information and don't have to create a life map that is very computationally uh, expensive. That is one of the problems with Islam, that it, it really needs uh, very high computational power. And that can be hard to accomplish in, in especially for, uh, for platforms that are uh, resource limited. Um, okay, now moving towards uh, 
what is what are the specifics of the platform that I'm using for my research. So um, uh, of course I'm, I'm using um, the open source uh, software and hardware that has been developed uh, for this project that is the open source um, autonomous vehicle controller that is basically the project that gave life to this uh, workshop but this is a, 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 a an architecture that has become uh, kind of prototypical for for our project studies in uh, having the uh, autopilot that is uh, uh, Aaron's um, work um, but combining that with a compute module to 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 uh, perform the very expensive uh, computations or the resource demanding um, computations and also uh, supporting these is the uh, HTPU to be able to perform machine learning inference uh, for detection of um, of objects for example and um, that allows to, 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 to have a system that can be carried by a platform and therefore be uh, self-contained. Um, here I just ha have a, a picture of how my, um, my experimental platform looks like at the moment. This is a, a, a work in progress, but here um, I, um, right now um, I'm, I'm working on uh, implementing the control uh, the quadrotor control and the stabilization on the um, on the on the autopilot, um, and the, all the other components are in different stages of development. Uh, now, um, here what I have is a um, an, ov an, um, an overview of of the proposal in focusing on the visual uh, part. That is, that the um, vehicle um, will be able to take uh, real-time uh, images of of the of the of the of of the surroundings of, of the of the place that is navigating, and using uh, machine learning um, inference detect uh, certain. Uh, landmarks that um, with known locations on a, on a georeference map. And then um, using these, um, these landmarks to, uh, to estimate the location of the, of the vehicle instead of using uh, GPS in, in in this case. And um, what is a georeferenced map? Well, it is, it, is, it, is a, it, is, it is a map, but it can also be a, a, an image, right? It can be an aerial image in which uh, certain landmarks have a known um, location, but in, in, in a, in San, in a in, have a, a known location, but a globally, uh, in, in, in global um, coordinates. So it is, it is, um, it is going to be uh, similar to, to having the, the, the GPS uh, coordinates. And um, the object detection of the, of the landmarks will be um, Perform using uh, convolutional neural networks. I don't want to go into many details regarding this because we have another presenter that is um, showing how this uh, object detection is being uh, implemented for for this open source uh, project. But um, I'm 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 going to do something very similar to to be able to detect the the objects. Uh, now. Um, of course, detecting the objects is is not enough. So, uh, basically, what that um, what that uh, process of detecting the landmarks and estimating the position based on on, on the landmarks uh, 
what what supports is a visual inertial um, odometry system that is uh, taking taking charge of 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 um, of driving the drone to 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 the location. But one of the problems with with odometry in general is that it has a drift over time. So uh, the estimation of the position gets uh, bad over time, and then that's where the traditional systems use a GPS to improve that or, or to bound that drift. So here the proposal is to use this visual system instead of GPS to be able to, um, to, to bound that drift in the odometry that, um, that, is, um, that is happening over time. Uh, now this, um, Pose estimation as this location um, estimation based on on this map and 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 the landmarks is um, what is called uh, aerial triangulation, and uh, so the the relative position of the of the UAB is calculated uh, using these landmarks. Well, and uh, one important factor here is that. Um, to be able to do this, you need to have an idea of the scale of the object that you are uh, detecting. So for that, um, what I'm going to use is using other sensors that are uh, to, to, be, to have a, a good idea of what is the altitude of the platform in order to be able to uh, have a good um, a good estimation of the scale or, or have a good um, idea of what the scale is to be able to, uh, to obtain the, the, the pose estimation. Um, okay, I think I'm a little bit over my time, but uh, thank you. And uh, do you have uh, any questions? Great, thanks, Carlos. Um, I think we we can probably afford the time for us for a question or two. If anyone um, listening wants to to ask one, go ahead and unmute yourself. And if not, yeah, go ahead, John. Yeah, I had a question about the images. So, is the plan to have like before like a drone is going on mission to upload images of like the area with the landmarks or would it be like sent over communication or how does it get the images that it references it against? Yes, so the detection of, of those landmarks they are based on the pre-trained model, right? So the model should be able to detect, uh, of course, as, as you said, this will only work on a, on, a, on a predefined area, right? In which you are going to uh, carry out your mission. So you have, uh, previous knowledge of what um, particular landmarks or important landmarks, like I don't know, a particular building, for example, is in that area, right? So then, the 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 idea here is to train the model to detect, for example, that particular building, right? So then, when you are then navigating that area, the model will be able to should be able to detect that building. Right. So then you therefore will know, OK, so I'm a certain I'm, then the, the UAV will calculate the relative position to that building. Right. Of course, uh, I, I'm kind of um, simplifying things here a little bit because you will need more than just one landmark. Right. To be able to estimate the post. But but yes, uh, is not per se that that that. Uh, like you are gonna have like those images to, to do the matching, but it's more that the model is pre-trained to detect uh, those landmarks in that area. I don't think that answers your, your question. No, oh, yeah, that, that helped, thank you. Great question, John. Does anyone uh, have a question also for Carlos? Anyone else? So I actually have one quick follow-up question, Carlos, for you. And that mm -hmm. is, you mentioned that unlike maybe traditional object detection, where you're trying to detect an entire class of object, in this case, you actually want to detect sort of unique objects. What makes a good landmark 
do you think uh, to, to navigate by? Yeah, that's that's a, a, a great question. So, um, and 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 this is um, this is this is per se a challenge. This is one of the of the biggest challenge here because detecting landmarks uh, when you are navigating at a certain altitude uh, carries certain particular uh, challenges in which many objects looks alike, right? And um, so in this case, I think that the best uh, approach will be to focus on, um, on buildings rather than, for example, uh, traffic signs or, or such, uh, as uh, those might not be, uh, you, you, you won't be able to have a, a, good, um, a good detection. Um, accuracy accuracy on those uh, it will be more on uh, particular buildings right makes sense cool okay um well if no one else has any other questions um thank you again carlos uh, you can stop sharing and the next speaker we will go to is um Stephen Taylor, uh, who in conjunction with a few other students worked on uh, how to power an outdoor sensor. And his talk is called Enabling Sustain Sustainably Powered Outdoor Sensor Networks by Harvesting Power from Microbes. And thank you for sharing immediately because now I don't have to look at my screen. <laughs> All, All right, right. can everybody Stephen? Cool, can everybody see that? Yeah. All right, so uh, hello, my name is Stephen Taylor. Um, I'm a researcher here at JLab at the University of California, Santa Cruz. And I'm here today to share with you how we can power outdoor sensor networks with microbes found on the earth. So what are outdoor sensor networks and why are they important? Why are we interested in them? So an outdoor sensor network very simply is a large field of small sensors that monitors environmental conditions in an outdoor environment. So each small sensing node gathers data on one small part of the overall sensor field and sends that data back to a central location for analysis. They're incredibly effective at monitoring environmental conditions over wide areas. So some cases where this might be extraordinarily useful are monitoring state parks for wildfires or monitoring air pollution levels in cities. But one area our lab is particularly interested in is soil moisture sensors, especially applied in an agricultural setting. Soil moisture sensors can save up to 56% on water on a farm. And so the benefits of this in a drought stricken state like California are huge. You know, California uses about 34 million acre feet of water a year. So we as a state could potentially be saving 17 million acre feet of water per year. That's enough water to cover about 15 football fields. So therefore our lab is interested in making soil sensors cheap, easy to use and easy to power because so moisture sensing technology is still not widely adopted. Even in California, only about 23% of farms in California are currently using any kind of soil moisture sensing. So why aren't sensor networks more adopted if they're not, uh, if they're so helpful? Well, there are some challenges to implementing these sensor networks, especially outdoors. Um, sensors and sensor nodes are prone to failure. Uh, and especially in a wildland or agricultural setting, the topologies are prone to change. But the obstacle my lab, JLab, is most interested in overcoming is the lack of a dedicated power infrastructure in an outdoor setting. You know, traditional off-grid power supplies, if you're thinking of solar or wind, are dependent on weather conditions that are difficult to predict and totally uncontrollable. So we're seeking to provide an off-grid sustainable energy supply that is dependent on conditions much more in our control. So that potential solution we've been looking at is microbial fuel cells. So very simply, a microbial fuel cell is an energy harvesting device that harvests its energy from microbes found in the soil. So why is this helpful for off-grid sensor networks? Well, one, there's very low maintenance. Once one of these is in the ground, it typically just goes. And two, it depends on environmental conditions that we can control. We, we found that they usually only need water and sometimes a little bit of fresh dirt. So I'm gonna take a little dive on how microbial fuel cells work, uh, the mechanics of them, how they operate. So a microbial fuel cell, commonly referred to as MFC in literature, uh, consists of an anode and a cathode 
separated by a substrate, an archive soil. So uh, certain families of microbes known collectively as exoelectrogens uh, live on a biofilm in the anode. Uh, the anode is anaerobic, meaning it is submerged in the soil, in the substrate, and cut off from oxygen. So these exoelectrogens, these microbes, like to offload electrons to an external source and they metabolize. So if you're to find them in the wild, they typically be living on a piece of scrap metal, offloading those electrons to that piece of metal. So as a load is connected from the anaerobic anode to the cathode, the electrons flow across the load and you have a power cell. So microbial fuel cells do have some quirks, some weirdness, and some limitations. A microbial fuel cell can at best produce about 1.2 volts of electricity, but sensing devices have evolved to be extraordinarily low power at this point, to the point where it is now very feasible to power said uh, devices with microbial fuel cells. And our lab is currently researching on how to stack these microbial fuel cells into, in an effort to build the total power output, which I'll be going over later. So I'm gonna change course a little bit and start talking about what our lab has done so far in order to characterize and understand these microbial fuel cells and how to use them and what we plan to work on in the future. So there've been some real world deployments on farms. So by that mean there's microbial fuel cells in the dirt, in the ground uh, for study. Uh, they're being monitored by data loggers and they're connected across the load and we're studying power patterns, how much power is being output in relation to certain environmental phenomena. So like I said, there's currently two at the UCSC farm, which you can go and check out. Uh, there's one deployed at, there's been one deployment at Stanford University, and there's been two former deployments by our collaborators at Northwestern University near Chicago. So we, here we have some images from our live website, uh, DirtViz. DirtViz is data power, as power measurements and voltage and current measurements from microbial fuel cells, both in the lab and at the UCSC farm. As you can see, the amount of power being generated isn't huge right now. It's only around 200 microwatts. But again, these sensing uh, devices have gotten to the point where they're so low power, it's now feasible to power them with said microbial fuel cells. So I'd like to take a beat and draw your attention to a phenomenon I personally find fascinating. So if everyone can see these spikes in the data as it shoots up and down in terms of power and then falls again, those actually correspond to the MFC is being watered, which has some seriously promising potential for maybe some pulse-based operations. So uh, a common challenge when you're trying to characterize low power energy harvesters is the expense of high accuracy, low power data loggers. And in response to that, and in order to expand the amount of microbial fuel cells uh, deployed for research, we're working with collaborators at UC San Diego to revise a low power sensing PCB. So the PCB's design is open source, it's on GitHub, and has been accepted for the Low Power Innovative Things Workshop 2022. And so we're gonna be continuing to work on our visions for this board uh, through the remainder of the year. So one of those quirks I mentioned earlier that makes it uh, hard to put MFCs in series is something called the shortage phenomenon. It's been reported that in wastewater microbial fuel cells, multiple MFCs in the same substrate, the wastewater, uh, may short across the ions in that substrate. So this, of course, is going to make it difficult to place multiple microbial fuel cells close to each other, for example, if you wanted to stack them in series. So a lab will be attempting to verify if this phenomenon occurs in soil microbial fuel cells, and if it does, to characterize when this phenomenon occurs so we can prevent it. Another quirk of microbial fuel cells is something called voltage reversal. So a voltage reversal has actually been a known phenomenon in microbial fuel cells since the mid 2000s. It's when an underperforming microbial fuel cell in series with others actually reverses polarity, causing a massive decrease in performance. So typically if you had three MFCs in series and one of them underwent voltage reversal, you would see a total of less power than if you just had one MFC. So in the coming months, our lab will be experimenting with the exacting conditions under which voltage reversal occurs so we can begin to stand it as it's gonna be an essential step in boosting microbial fuel cell power output in the future. So um, I'd like to start by thanking my collaborators at JLab um, and our lab's collaborators at Northwestern and UC San Diego. Uh, my lab and my personal contact information is on the slide as is our data visualization website, dirtbiz.jlab.ucsc.edu. Um, our lab website is also posted as well and the GitHub for our lab and the GitHub for the soil power sensor board. I'm open to any questions if anyone has any.
Great. Uh, thanks, Stephen. Um, I see uh, Daniel has a question, and I'll just read it from the chat, which is, are there any known impacts from microbial soil fuel cells on soil fertility, increase, decrease, or soil microbial composition changes? In other words, uh, if I can restate that, do the presence of the fuel cells themselves affect the surrounding environment? And if so, um, is this a problem? Hmm. That's a great question. And I'm going to say yes and no. So, I, so microbial fuel cells are pretty new. And so I will speak from experience that if you put these purely in a lab, they will eventually run out of acetate or the stuff the microbes like to uh, metabolize off and suck that out of the local environment. That hasn't been known to occur on real world deployments as much because there's a constant cycling of fresh dirt and fertilized soil. So uh, it's a potential maybe, but probably not. Right. I don't know if that's a sufficient answer. And then Colleen posted a text saying that soil MFCs can be used to do soil cleanup. So that's an interesting, uh, interesting element. Um, yeah. Go ahead. Build, build off that wastewater MFCs have also been applied as a way to purify water in some instances. There's been some work by civil engineers on that. Interesting. Um, I have a quick question, and that is you you allude to, you know, the anode and the cathode, and in, mm -hmm. I believe the anode is was mentioned that the microbes are on an acetate film of some kind. What is the actual physical structure of the the anode and the cathode? Like, what are these things on? Mm, yeah, so typically what you would have is the most commonly used is like carbon fiber or graphite felt. Um, and so you place them in your dirt or your wastewater and the, exoelectrogens start to thrive on that environment because they have a load to offload those electrons to. And the film forms naturally as this kind of slimy looking stuff that's actually the microbes themselves kind of forming a colony on the anode. Interesting. And, the, and what's the construction of the cathode then? Oh, that is also just another, like you would cut out like a circle of carbon fiber uh, felt for both the cathode and the anode. I see, okay. Cool. What's the next step uh, with regard to, I mean, I guess you've gone over that in some detail, like mm -hmm. trying to basically come up with in series. Oh, I see Carlos has a question, which is um, what is the typical lifespan of the cell? Hmm. Well, that depends. Uh, some cells have been going for, I think like over a year now. I think our collaborator has one at uh, UC San Diego that's been producing power for a year. Uh, the microbes themselves are hard to kill. Once they have their colony going, we've even found that you can sometimes place them in fresh dirt and they'll keep going. So I'm going to say indefinite. We haven't managed to, you know, hire down like, oh, they only last two years, you know, anything like that. Interesting. Okay. Um, does anyone else have any questions? If not, thanks, Stephen. Uh, very interesting talk. Uh, you can stop sharing your screen and we will move to the last presenter today. Um, this is Prane Matur, who's going to talk about pathfinding using course markers on computationally constrained system. And um, Prane, if you want to go ahead and start your screen. Yeah, perfect. I don't know if you're speaking, Prani, but we can't hear you if so. I'm sorry, talking now? Yeah, now we can hear you. Yeah, apparently if I start my screen sharing, it stops, pauses my audio. Oh. That's definite flaw. Yeah, if you're talking, we can't hear you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. Yeah. I didn't do mind sharing the presentation if it's not. In yes, hang on one second. I'll pull it up.
and share a screen. Here we go. Does that work? Uh, yeah, thank you so much. Oh, sorry about that, everyone. Thank you so much for joining, uh, everyone. Uh, so I'm Prane, and I have completed this work as part of the Google Summer of Code 2022 under the super helpful mentorship of my mentors, Aaron Hunter and Carlos Espinosa. The title is Pathfinding Using Course Markers on Compute Constraint Systems. So this is the detailed abstract of my talk, and I've listed it here just for the sake of completeness. But so that I do not lose half of my audience in the first two slides, I will shift to a better explanation of my work in the following slide. So my work was essentially presenting a mapping algorithm that uses landmark detections from a camera that was mounted on the autonomous vehicle, uh, of course, with limited computational capabilities. So we chose to perform the detection using the efficient debt model architecture with quantized weights on the Corel Edge TPU so that we could run the inference in real time. And these detections were then used to create a map of course markers relative to the vehicle, exploiting the intrinsics of the onboard camera and the known geometry of the markers themselves. Oh, next slide. So the outline of uh, the, uh, the next slide. Hang on a second, Prana. I'm trying to figure out how to do this in the context of Zoom. Oh, sorry. Yeah, sure. It seems to be randomly moving. Let's try this. Ah, there we go. Thanks. Thanks. So yeah, the, the outline of my talk is presented here. I, I'll briefly cover the design ideologies as to why we chose this particular model, the implementation of my results, uh, the implementation of my work, and the results of my contributions. Oh, yeah. So yeah, data, data, data. Uh, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle very famously said that uh, I can't make bricks without clay, and that is exactly what when you work with uh, deep learning models is is can be applied over here. So a model can only be as good as the data we give it. Uh, it'll uh, the model performance is severely affected by the kind of data that we pass that we train our model on, and a really important aspect of what we wanted to do here was take care of illumination changes, occlusions. Uh, take care of even blurry images. So it was uh, really important to streamline the data, for, the data flow process as we wanted uh, this, process, this pipeline, data processing pipeline to be scalable and re-implemented by anyone who chooses to use this work with their own data set. And we found that uh, while TensorFlow, which is what I used uh, to create, uh, to implement this architecture, uh, we found that while they do provide certain pre-processing steps, a more scalable method was using RoboFlow uh, which made the process of annotation, pre-processing, pre and augmentation extremely streamlined. And apart from that, it also provided a really, really detailed analysis of the data and the balance of data that I had between different uh, classes. Uh, next, please. So here is an example of the kind of data that uh, we did actually use. Uh, as you can see, that the, they provided us with functionalities that uh, where we could tune the, the split between training validation and test images. And these are actual images of our data set. And I spent the first two weeks of my, uh, you know, my contribution period actually just annotating data and analyzing data. And RoboFlow did allow us to choose uh, the percentage splits. And we opted for an 88 is to 8 is to 4 training validation and test split. Uh, because he wanted the model to be trained on as wide a variety of conditions as possible. Next slide. So here is an uh, I've just a few screen grabs of uh, the kind of analysis that RoboFlow did actually offer to us. So this uh, we found that certain classes were really overly represented in our data, and so we had to balance our data, and we did this with a combination of augmentation uh, as well as training more samples, of course. Uh, the image on the top right is actually an annotation heat map, which told us that, okay, you have so many images and X number of images, and out of these only, some of them are an annotated. And apart from that, on, in one of the final stages, it also allowed us to augment our data set by the standard augmentation methodologies, like cropping, rotation, sharing, changing saturation, and uh, inverting bounding boxes. So what essentially this helped us to do was uh, it improved the size of our data set 
to around 1366 images, whereas I ended up annotating only 400 or 500 images, if I remember correctly, in the beginning. So it really helped in improving the variety and the size of our data set. Next slide. Uh, okay, I will briefly just cover, uh, it's important to understand why we chose this, uh, the efficient debt model, which is what I use for detecting landmarks. Uh, we wanted a model that was lightweight and we wanted, it's always a trade-off or so, uh, in, in previously it's always been a major, major trade-off between accuracy and using lightweight models. Uh, whenever somebody wanted to improve the accuracy of the object detection models, they would just increase uh, the size of the backbone and they would have like more, uh, uh, you know, sort of more CNN net, uh, CNNs connected after each other and more parameters. And uh, this really uh, imp uh, increased the computation complexity of actually performing inference. Efficient debt was actually an uh, amazing balance between efficiency and accuracy. And what they did was they essentially created a feature network that would upscale and downscale their uh, feature, uh, the features that you uh, uh, find out in your image. And they did this by not just randomly fusing, uh, you know, uh, features from different scales. They actually learned which features contribute to your higher and lower level semantics and created a weighted bidirectional feature network as well as an, an other important part was compound scaling, which jointly scaled up the backbone feature network and resolution. Now this was important because uh, we work at a lower resolution uh, just because we wanted to grab images faster. And uh, you could, supposing you have, a more, uh, you have uh, the need for working with high resolution, you could do, do this purely by uh, in, increasing the compound scaling coefficient, which jointly scaled up you know, the size of uh, the backbone, the depth, the width, the feature network, and the box class prediction network. So it offered a, a lot of flexibility, as well as uh, amazing accuracy in comparison to networks that were really, really large when compared to the, its size. The next slide. Uh, I won't go into the, but this is the architecture, but yeah, essentially what I explained in the previous slide. So next slide. Uh, Oh, this was a very important aspect of my project was uh, using the Google Corel HDP. So we uh, implemented our algorithm on the Raspberry Pi. And for performing inference, we wanted to uh, get it to perform inference as fast as possible and get it to run in real time. So the Corel USB accelerator was an HDPU coprocessor, which enabled high speed ma machine learning inference on a wide range of systems. Uh, so we actually shifted the uh, the deep learning model by quantizing the weights and shifted it shifted the entire inference to working on this uh, edge DPU. And the advantage of this is its power consumption was very low. So it does not, it won't drain your battery because primary, the primary use of this would be deploying it on along with embedded systems such as the Raspberry Pi that we used. And the performance improvements were uh, really amazing. It would, it could execute state of the art mobile vision models such as mobile net at 400 FPS. This is something that they claim and uh, we uh, were able to improve the speed of our model as well. So it all in all, it was an amazing package. Uh, next slide. So the reason that I mentioned, uh, so I'll just briefly summarize why uh, we had to uh, take into account the design considerations that they used while making the HDP. So it has only eight MB of SRAM for caching model parameters. And we had to decide out of uh, the various family of efficient debt models. So the family of efficient debt models has have different compound scaling coefficients, uh, you know, right from zero all the way to seven. And we had to sort of, there was a trade-off associated between inference time and accuracy, and we needed to decide on which model to choose. And uh, certain design con considerations in the edge GPU forced us to go only for uh, efficient rate light zero and efficient rate light one, because uh, uh, we could not, uh, if we choose a compound scaling coefficient that was greater than one, it would actually have to fetch some model parameters from the host system memory, that is the Raspberry Pi, which was actually increasing the latency associated with inference. And we really didn't want that. So we analyzed what was the accuracy that we were getting between the first two compound scaling coefficients, efficient light zero and light one versus their uh, 
you know higher order compound scaling coefficients and we found that after quantization and uh, using these uh, using the compound scaling coefficients in 0 and 1 we were actually able to get uh, comparable results in accuracy and inference time and the results are summarized in the next slide uh, so if you can if you look uh, we tested it on a simple uh, cpu uh, this was not even equipped with a gpu and it was a simple laptop uh, efficient at like zero you the bold values are the maximum values so the average precision and average recall values are comparable even though the maximum uh, is going to be varied slightly between modules but uh, we found that the uh, uh, the performance was extremely comparable and that is why we decided to go with the efficient debt zero family of uh, efficient debt zero model architecture uh, next slide so uh, a major focus of our project was actually uh, to enable anyone to deploy this network with their own data set in a very very simple manner and because of that we uh, created two ways to do that we've created a jupyter notebook and uh, okay i was going to open that link and show but i'll just probably post the link in the chat but um, what that does is you can actually train your own model between uh, anywhere between 15 and 20 minutes once you have your data set prepared uh, you just need to literally click play on running the cells and the entire model was can be uploaded to your drive and you should be linked to your drive and the Jupyter Notebook makes it possible, uh, Google Colab, sorry, makes it possible to link to your drive. Uh, so you, you don't have to worry about training the model at all. You just need to run the cells and prepare your data set. Uh, and if someone wanted, uh, we know that, you know, sometimes when you want to develop things, it is convenient to have a local setting. So we also created an Anaconda environment, which you can just replicate by using a YAML file that is available on that link. And you can export it uh, in your own and create your own space and get you to run. So I think there's a screenshot in the next slide. Um, so yeah, that is something you just need to run the model and you'll essentially have a trained model in 20 minutes probably, or as long as it takes to train depending on the size of your data set. Uh, next slide. So these were the, look, uh, these were the detections that you were getting from the efficient at zero model. And the next step was now using these detections to uh, actually sort of pinpoint where these are in 3D space relative to my own position. So relative to the position of our autonomous vehicle. And we did this by exploiting the known geometry of my landmarks. So we chose to go with uh, different colored uh, traffic cones. And once we knew what dimensions we were dealing with and the bounding box limits that we were getting, we could use this to calculate their depth with respect to the vehicle. So we did this using uh, the formula in the next slide. Uh, essentially very simple geometry that is associated with uh, camera intrinsics. Uh, next slide. Uh, so simple maths, we know what the height of the cone was, we know the bounding box size that we were getting, and we knew the focal length of our camera. So we use that to calculate the depth of the cone. And next slide. Uh, so these were the results that we started uh, getting when we started to reproject our detections into 3D space. The video that you see here is uh, borrowed from ETH Zurich who demonstrated it on their autonomous uh, vehicle. And uh, I think there are a series of next slide with just uh, results uh, corresponding to blue and yellow cones, which is what they used. So uh, an interesting part that you can see here is it's able to detect cones that are very, very far off and that are extremely uh, small in size. Uh, a disclaimer over here is that I did have to retrain the model slightly for this particular data set because the cone, uh, to detect cones that were extremely far. But this was again done in a, a very short period of time. And I used the model that we had already trained uh, on for a previous data set. So retraining, redeploying it was extremely fast. I think the next slides are all uh, just results uh, corresponding to uh, the detections in uh, of these cones in that particular video uh, and we tested it on two different videos so for example over here this was after training the model on the eth data set so you can see that it still was able to detect the detections uh, that i have in a completely different environment and scene 
and uh, the map over there that you can see is uh, you can actually use these detections to calculate a path for uh, traversing uh, your using your vehicle and this was the last uh, last part of my work it's a lot of this was still uh, will still come under the purview of future work because I wasn't able to complete it completely. But we did, however, make an initial estimate to uh, initial attempt at estimating the variance of the directions that you were getting to use them in probably a more complicated framework, such as the SLAM method, or, you know, uh, essentially getting the quality of how good my measurements are. And we did this by using the depth measurements from both the width and the length of the landmarks because I, I have uh, you know the height of my bounding box and the width of my bounding box and I know both of these dimensions in my landing marks uh, in my form of my landmarks so I was able to uh, get these variance measurements and uh, since these varied widely between different detections I actually used the sliding window based average for uh, getting these variances uh, and now the results so we were able to improve, this is sort of the main result, we were able to uh, get, uh, uh, improve inference speed to 119 milliseconds. And we were able to get the frames per second to 8.4 on a Raspberry Pi, which was uh, pretty, this is the, the minimum speed that you were able to get. Sometimes while uh, uh, evaluating a method, it also went up to 11 and 12. And uh, I think uh, there were certain uh, delays associated with acquiring the image from the camera as well. If that is surpassed, I think we were able to uh, achieve um, FPS uh, of even 20 plus. So that is something that we were actually really proud of. Uh, next slide. And in comparison, when we tested our methods on uh, even in a laptop that uh, an i3 CPU powered laptop with a quad core processor, we were able to get just uh, two frames per second and an average inference speed of 500 milliseconds. Next slide. And on uh, just simply a Raspberry Pi, uh, we, we got, uh, it was nowhere comparable to the results that we were getting with the Core LH CPU. This is a video of our uh, demonstration. I can't get it to play. Uh, I think I can probably share my screen for this part. Uh, okay, but yeah, I, do that. I will do that. And uh, I'm also I'm open for questions. I will just share the result. You know, let me pull that up first and then we'll have questions in a minute. So I guess I can describe what's going on in this video since I've watched it a few times. Basically what, um, what ETH Zurich did with, with the same, basically this navigation problem, but with much, much um, higher powered resources is they go through and they use a similar object detector um, than the one Prande developed, um, but they're running it on, you know, super power, powerful computer. And they have, of course, a real race car and stuff. <laughs> But basically they do an entire circuit and they, they map the location of all the cones. And then once they've mapped all the locations of the cones, they, they find kind of an optimal time path through the, through the cone network because the cones demark basically the race course boundaries. So that's why, that, that's basically the genesis of why we chose this particular problem to solve because we can set up an arbitrary course uh, or use an arbitrary um, selection of, of colored cones for landmarks to navigate by. So I think uh, maybe Prana, you can speed through the video or we can, uh, we can open up the floor for questions um, while we continue to watch it. Does anyone have something for Prana? Um, I have a question for you, Prana, and this is re relative. This is basically, what advice would you give Carlos 
uh, knowing what his problem that he's trying to solve in terms of identifying and training landmarks that he could use to navigate um, from above. If you're speaking, I can't hear you. <laughs> there you go. Sorry about that. No, uh, uh, so essentially, I would say that he would have to choose. Uh, I think it, it, the efficient data architecture makes a lot of sense for him. Because if he chose a higher compound scaling coefficient, that uh, would mean that he would scale features at multiple levels. Now, what that means is that uh, if he's at an altitude where he can see roads, buildings, and stuff, uh, you are essentially able to get all of these features detected by your these all of these features extracted by your uh, you know your convolutional network because it will do this at multiple uh, levels. So uh, it's essentially going to come to know right from your uh, you know the smaller inroads, buildings, uh, landmarks, and all the way down to probably less. Uh, you know, less visible landmarks that are smaller in scale. Uh, an example probably would be, supposing you have a car park or something. Now, uh, if I just uh, cement, uh, if I just chose a model that would uh, have, you know, fewer layers in my congenital network, it would probably ignore this because uh, that is not what, uh, it would be, it would just ignore these features. But supposing uh, you, you run this at multiple scales, and you uh, you find that uh, you know you're actually at the same place again while you're training your network, and you often observe these smaller vehicles as, as seen from you know aerial footage. It'll probably be able to detect that position really well. So I uh, this architecture would make a lot of sense for a problem like that. Uh, and apart from that, uh, I think a, a bit more. Uh, I think that's all I have for uh, yeah, Carlos's problem. I, I would have to think a lot about, that's essentially a tougher problem to solve because repetitiveness is an issue in aerial footage, but uh, yeah, definitely seems like a solvable problem given this particular model architecture. Interesting, cool, okay. Well, thanks very much for your talk, Prane, and I'll, again, for all of your work over the summer. We very much appreciate it. Thank you so much for the chance and opportunity. I loved working with this. Thank you. Absolutely. Okay. Um, well, I think that comes to more or less the conclusion of the workshop. Um, I want to thank all of the speakers. I think uh, all of the work is very interesting and, and I appreciate the effort put into producing the slides and, and um, creating the presentations. Um, and unless there are any other questions for me for uh, work for the future or anything like that, then I believe we can stop recording and close the session. Anyone have any comments? Great. Well, I also I want to thank everyone for attending. I appreciate it. I hate to have gone to the trouble of putting together a workshop and have no one show up. So it's really nice to see as many people joining as, as there are. So thanks very much. <laughs>